So good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST for short. My name is Ariel Liji, and I'm CCAST's Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator based out of the University of Arizona. For those of you who are new to CCAST, CCAST supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars like this one, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species control, aquatic restoration, and drought and climate adaptation, as well as fire and climate adaptation. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Jeff Bennett about the Grasslands Not Badlands project in Big Bend National Park, followed by Rebecca Mann, who will talk about her research in Utah using mulch for grassland restoration. And as a final reminder, uh, these pre the presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, so say, go ahead and save those questions for the presenters until the end. You can put them in the chat to, to keep track of them before, until we get there. Uh, without further ado, I will introduce Jeff Bennett. So Jeff has a diverse set of skills, including that link hydrology and habitats. He's managed water resources in Arizona and New Mexico and worked as a hydrologist for the National Park Service in Big Bend National Park and the Rio Grande Wild and Scenic River. Jeff helped to develop the science to support environmental flows for the Rio Grande and implemented grassland and stream restoration projects. He was the U.S. lead on the conservation assessment for the Big Bend Rio Bravo region and has been working on conservation issues in the Big Bend region for over 15 years. So Jeff, I'll pass it to you. Feel free to share your screen and uh, put myself on mute. Thanks, Ariel. Let me see if I can make this work as easily as it did before. Of course not. Okay, I think you should be seeing not my notes page, but my presentation page. Is that correct? That looks great. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Bennett. I work um, for the Rio Grande Joint Venture. I'm employed by the um, American Bird Conservancy. Uh, my role with the Joint Venture is to increase bird habitat, both in grasslands and in streams. Um, that's about all I'm going to say about birds today. I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, low-tech process-based uh, methods for um, rejuvenating or rehabilitating highly degraded um, grassland habitats or for, formerly grass shrubland habitats. Sorry, I should turn that off. That is now off. My slide's not advancing. If you try hovering your mouse over the bottom left of the full screen presentation one, sometimes these little arrows show up. Yeah, on the bottom left side. Oop, there you go. And there's that oh, arrow. No. That'll work. Thank you. You're most That's welcome. That's new. I'm sorry, let me shut that off. I guess whoever called on my cells trying to reach me on the land. Okay, so Big Bend National Park is located in West Texas in the Chihuahuan Desert. There's a map here showing a pullout of the northern end of the park. Um, this is, uh, was added to the park in the late 80s. This was an old, um, what we called the Heart Ranch, um, and it's north of the Rocios Mountains. You can see, I so I, when I came to the park in 2003, I inherited an assessment project for this um, this area where they were um, very, the previous physical scientists had been very concerned about erosion. Um, you can see they'd map um, over a hundred stock tanks, over a hundred diversions, um, and um, found problems associated with all that disturbance. Here's some examples of those problems. Um, on the left there, you can see some diversion dams um, that have been breached by the arroyos. And on, on the bottom of that is a, a aerial view of that 
I believe those versions were put in to deal with erosion that was already in place. On the right um, is some of the sort of degraded landscapes associated with both disturbances and diversions. Um, so this is what was our challenge. We've got uh, probably uh, we didn't we didn't have the resources to map all the uh, disturbed or degraded grasslands, but I think it's safe to say there's ten or twenty thousand acres out there that look like those two pictures on the right. That bottom right one there, you can see, you know, even the creosote is um, dead and dying. Uh, that very bottom right picture shows you where the soil level had been when that plant rooted. No, we call that a pedestal. So how to get this way? Um, Pre-NPS management, grazing pressure had removed the vegetative cover. Um, once the park was established and livestock was removed, many of the um, upper elevation and middle elevation grasslands um, began to recover, or grasslands and shrublands began to recover. Um, but the lowland uh, areas did not. So the park service set out um, on a restoration or trying to understand um, what was going on and why. Um, and they quickly focused in on processes, and I'll get to a little bit for that later, but uh, I want to, uh, or what the Park Service response was, but first I want to talk about sort of what we think the main process is. The loss of vegetative cover led to the formation of a physical crust in these um, hot fine grained soils, um, meaning there was no infiltration and we couldn't, plants weren't getting the, um, the rain rainfall. So, this little conceptual model here of how physical crusts form in fine grained soils. Basically, we have large raindrops that smash into the soil, knock the finer grains off the bigger clods or pedons, and, and push those fine grains into the um, pore spaces and, and clog off or um, reduce infiltration. What you get then is runoff and erosion associated with that runoff. The restoration activities from the Soil and Water Soil Conservation Service and the National Park Service in the 50s recognized those hydrologic problems. Um, they pitted lots of areas. That's that bottom right picture. Top right there just show, shows what they were starting with. Um, they pitted lots and lots of acres um, with these. This was an implement dr drug behind a tractor. They also did um, pitting with, with um, big machines. Um, they also planted Tobosa on thousands of acres. None of this worked. Um, so when I inherited the project in, in assessment phase, we started trying to grow grass and increase vegetative cover. Um, so one second here, I keep going to the wrong page to advance. There we go. So what did we do? We pitted and we planted grass, just like they, they did in the fifties. Um, you can see those, those on the left, there are some hand dug pits and those, that little, little bits of white fabric you see there are actually seed balls that were little seed packets that were put in the bottom of those. On the right there, you can see where we planted container, um, plants and we used a, a hydrogel to hopefully get them to survive. Again, none of this worked. So <clears throat> we got to thinking deep, more deeply about it and decided we needed to cover, cover the ground to protect it from rainfall and solar uh, radiation, and we needed to scale up. So this was our first, one of our first attempts. We put out a, a large erosion control blanket, tried to seed underneath it. Um, and you can see there we've got some germination, um, but all of that wilted. None of that, none of that grass survived. So we moved on to another idea. We started covering our uh, erosion control blankets with brush. Um, so this is an erosion. We seeded underneath this by hand, covered the um, um, the seeded area with an erosion control blanket. This is an Excelsior mat, and then we covered it with brush. Measuring temperatures and moisture, you can see that the, our treatment there 
significantly lower temperatures from 132 far outside the treatment to one, uh, 123 nearby and then 105 underneath underneath the treatment and soil moistures went up as well. So this is a site, um, this is a site where we used the hydro mulcher to put the seed out. Um, the left is July 20th, 2004. On the right, after monsoon season, you know, we, you can see that we grew a lot of cane blue stem and all went to flower that in that one monsoon season. So we felt pretty good about that. This is an aerial view of that. This um, just to the right of to the right of this picture is a, a large gully system, and we were trying to get above that gully and slow slow the water flow off of this, and hopefully decrease erosion in that gully system. Here is um, so how well did it let work? Um, I left the park in 2018. I visited just a couple of weeks ago and took pictures of some of our sites. So on the left is a site that had been treated with, um, had been hydro seeded and then covered with Excelsior mats and then wood multiplied. And that's the same site on the right. Um, what is that? Almost 20 years later. So again, I think we feel pretty good about that. The sites are persistent. This is the same site looking in another direction. You can see we had a couple of, um, Couple of the parts of the of our of these treatments aren't surviving as or faring as well as other parts. Still, the site looks pretty good. Um, and I'm getting close to the end here. I just wanted to show you um, sort of how this looks on the landscape level. Um, on the left is an aerial photo of, of a site along Route 11, or excuse me, three, Highway 385. Uh, north of the park headquarters and on the right is that site in um, 2017 and you can see um, where we have uh, put out these treatments a little differently. Uh, one of the lessons we learned is the long linear things aren't always appropriate. Um, so we got to where in the rills and then in the shallow gullies we started making more like a chevron um, type approach. That's what these are right here. Um, and this site is much more stable than it was when we started. But you can see there's here's a big erosion. A, a balloon is what we call these moving into the site. Um, and we haven't treated it since. Um, another thing to notice on this picture is the decrease of vegetation in the um, in the arroyos and in the draws. Um, that's because this is after 20 years of drought. The drought started in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, and we had quite a bit of vegetation in the low spots, and a lot of that is beginning to disappear. And that's just the effects of long-term drought. So our conclusions, uh, branch mulch is an effective low-tech process-based restoration technique that basically provides a surrogate for vegetative co cover, intercepting rainfall, increasing through fall and protecting the soil. Soil moistures increase, soil temperatures decrease, allowing our plants to survive germination and not just wilt. Branch mulch increased soil organic matter and amount of soil microbes. I did not talk about a master's thesis that was done on this um, project, but there was one that um, I think it was put out in 2007. If you want um, a link to that, I can send it to you or a digital copy anyways. Um, between 2008 and 2017, grass cover decreased while cover by Forbes increased. Our, our seed mix was just grass. We had tried Forbes, that didn't work, so we eventually just went with all grass. Um, and through time, the, the vegetative community looked you know, uh, less like grass and more like a mix of grass and Forbes. Cover of plant litter and dead plants also increased. Improved conditions persisted for 15 years. It's I guess it's really more like 20 inches we should say 20 years. Um, and we're happy enough with that that I'll be leaving this afternoon um, to go talk about um, doing this on some private land outside of the park. Um, I'll end with this slide. I like this slide because it sort of shows that um, the Excelsior mat and the seeding alone is not enough. We, you've got to have the brush to shade the soil. Um, we don't have grass out here, but we do have it underneath the brush. And with that, I guess I could take questions or we can wait till the end. 
Thanks, Jeff. We got a few questions that came in. We'll wait until actually, why don't we um why don't we jump in with those questions because you may have to leave early. Um, so there are a couple questions that we got in the chat. One from Karen, Karen Chapman. Um, did you want to ask that question, Karen? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You kind of answered this already, Jeff, but I was curious because in the first um, set of pictures, the treatments um, were sort of laid out. Uh, and I, I was wondering if you, how you chose where to put them on the landscape, but then you noted later, you changed where you placed them. Um, so I was just curious if you could expand on that a little so bit. When we first started, we sort of picked some easy sites that were really flat and level and the long linear treatment sort of work. You know, if we're thinking about um, sort of imit imitating banded vegetation, the, which is the natural arrangement of, of vegetation and arid landscapes, that sort of work. But then when we moved into sites with more rills and more gullies, um, and not, uh, not deep gullies, but I guess just really just rills, um, the linear thing just didn't work out. So we started with um, sort of a V pointed upstream and then that turned into a chevron and then that was hard to do with um, equipment with a disc because we were disking this before we hydro seeded. Um, so they ended up sort of being just squares in the middle of these rills. Um, but the point is the, uh, um, I might've missed a slide. I wanted to show you, I uh, totally missed the slide, but um, you know, these, these do block water. Water does pond upstream of these and builds quite a bit of vegetation outside of the bands. Um, so it, when, when we're working on sites that aren't completely flat, we have to sort of adapt our arrangement. Thanks, Jeff. And there was another question from Tyler. Tyler, do you want to ask that question? The, uh, the question from Tyler was what kind of brush was used and uh, noted the similarity to connectivity modifiers. So the brush came from different Park Service projects, uh, primarily um, uh, fuel reduction projects around uh, developed areas. Um, there was also some uh, tamaris that was brought in from uh, projects along the Rio Grande where we were um, cutting it down basically and treating the stumps. So we hauled that in. Most of this brush, you know, the the, the part prior to prior to this project normally would pile this stuff and burn it. Um, which requires hauling it to one part of the park and then a burn plant and a burn boss and hiring people. Um, for this, we were able to divert all that out in, into our sites in the desert. And so uh, we felt like that was a win-win for both um, science and resource management and the, the fire guys. But let's work for them and, and we got some restoration out of it. There's a lot of juniper. Um, there's some cypress, there's pine, there's mesquite, there's bee brush, all sorts of stuff. And it's not all equal. The finer stuff like bee brush and white brush is not as effective as uh, pine and uh, juniper, things like that. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Scott asked a, a question as well. Scott, are you here to ask that question or shall I ask it? Scott's question was about how the project got around NPS archaeology concerns. Uh, we did compliance. We didn't get around it. <laughs> Sometimes the only way around it is through it. Um, thanks, Jeff. I think that that's the only questions that we have in there for now. We can jump back to more questions at the end, and I will pass it on to Rebecca. So I'll, um, Rebecca, we can start sharing your screen while I introduce you. Um, Rebecca is a US Geological Survey biologist focused on restoring functioning ecosystems on the Colorado Plateau with the goal of bringing scientific knowledge to the management community through collaborative research projects. Rebecca has been working on restoration projects out of the Southwest Biological Science Center in Moab, Utah since 2016. And before this, she was involved with studies of rare plant biology, rangeland health, vegetation monitoring methods, and assisted with management of a citizen science program. 
Um, and with that, I'll pass it on to you, Rebecca. Awesome. Um, can everyone see and hear me okay? Or see the presentation? Yeah, it's looking great. Thanks. Great. Okay, super. Um, yeah, thanks, Ariel. And, and thanks, Jeff. Um, it's really cool to see long term results of um, mulch reclamation like that. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about um, mulching for reclamation of, of severely disturbed sites, also in arid ecosystems. Um, and let's see, getting into the slide navigation. Okay, so I, um, as mentioned, I, I, um, I have an, a master's in ecology from Utah State, and since then I've been working with USGS on restoration and reclamation field studies. I'm based in Moab with the, science, uh, the Southwest Biological Science Center. Um, and I really love using science and collaborations to help find management tools, um, working with a, a variety of people in the field. And our research that we've been doing, we're, we're working in degraded arid rangelands. Um, some of them are um, overgrazed um, or historically overgrazed. Uh, some of them have been impacted by energy development. Um, I've been with USGS for a while, so we're coming up um, on five years of data for some of the projects I've been working on, and we're starting to crunch the numbers. Um, my first impression is that mulch is a good treatment, so I was really interested to prepare this presentation and find out if it works and under what circumstances. So this talk, I'll, I'll just quickly overview oil and gas reclamation and why it's why it matters, um, talk about our collaborative reclamation research and results from those field studies and then takeaways. Um, so oil and gas reclamation, or I'm sorry, oil and gas development um, is pretty harsh on the landscape. There's, when, when well pads are developed, uh, the topsoil is typically removed, uh, piled off to the side, and then that well pad is kept level and plant free during its operation and then once it's time for reclamation, the topsoil is often replaced, seeded, regraded, and seeded. Um, but it's been increasing and it has a substantial footprint on the landscape. There's a huge network of well pads and roads and pipelines that connect them all. It's well, um, oil and gas um, is concentrated in the inner mountain west. Um, so there are a lot of hot spots of development. In total, counting wells that are existing and in progress of being developed, there's a, almost 300,000 of them covering nearly a million and a half acres. Oops. Um, so just thinking about how energy development impacts compared to degraded rangeland, um, but there's differences according to you know, what they're shaped like and how big they are and particularly in the amount of disturbance. Um, so energy um, development typically has higher soil disturbance, uh, but all of these types of um, degraded rangelands have a lot of common challenges when it comes to reclamation, as far as physical and biological barriers to reclamation. So anything from low, low precipitation in these arid sites um, to soil loss, um, erosion, depleted seed banks, et cetera. And hopefully mulch can help mediate a lot of these um, challenges. So part of our oil and gas reclamation work with the USGS um, has been to compile available scientific information in articles and reports um, looking at what others have found um, as far as um, techniques for oil and gas reclamation. And so from over 3000 papers that we identified in a, in a publication search, we, we whittled that down to approximately 700 papers that met some criteria as far as quality and relevance. And then 400 of those papers related to reclamation practices as opposed to monitoring techniques or other topics. And of those practices papers, 9% or 41 of them addressed mulching as a tactic for reclamation. So looking at those 41 papers related to mulching, um, let's see, and actually I'm just realizing 
<laughs> um, so of the 41 papers related to mulching, um, about 40% of them um, had used hay or straw as a mulch material. Um, about 20% had used some kind of wood product like bark or wood chips or sawdust. And then there were also considerations of vertical mulch. So brush piles, for instance, um, mats and erosion control blankets, hydro mulching, and a couple of them looked at rocks. Um, and then within those 41 papers, um, several benefits of mulching were noted. Um, the blue bars show um, citations within those papers or even just general statements that were not cited. Um, and these are different classes of the benefits of mulching for reclamation. Um, and then, I'm sorry, the, the black line is showing what the original data from those papers actually found. Um, so there were benefits ranging from reducing erosion to um, various impacts on soil quality, such as um, increasing water retention or improving the soil structure, um, to benefits on plant growth. That was the most commonly found um, benefit of mulch. And then there were a variety of microsite benefits um, that helped to result in those uh, plant benefits, such as um, increasing wind protection or cooling the soil surface. Um, however, a lot of those, these papers also found some, some inconsistencies <clears throat> or even drawbacks um, of mulching. So of the original um, data in those 41 publications, um, two of them found that mulching actually suppressed the seeded species compared to controls. Um, there were no effects in six of those studies. And then several papers found that the effects of mulch really differed according to a variety of uh, metric or a variety of reasons. Um, it could be that the metric being measured um, differed according to mulching. So maybe mulching helped germination, but did not increase plant biomass or vice versa. Um, there were species level differences. Some species responded positively, others didn't. Mulching type and depth mattered, and then there were variations according to how much precip, what kind of site, um, the time since mulching. So what we gleaned overall from this uh, literature review is that overall mulch, mulching seems to have a positive effect, but there's a lot of um, variability. Um, and so in addition to that literature review, we have been conducting field studies, and this is um, an effort to co-produce science. So we meet with other land management agencies um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, who's concerned about um, rare and threatened uh, plant species. And we've been sharing our knowledge as far as what we have experienced and what we think works and what doesn't work, where are knowledge gaps. And then we discuss um, you know, what our research questions ought to be. So in the case of mulch, we wanted to know, is it beneficial and how does it compare to other treatments that we might be able to try? And then we work together with industry to reclaim these sites and install an experiment on a subset of well pads. We work in the Uinta Basin, um, so just south of the Uinta Mountains in northern Utah. Um, very low precipitation, six to nine inches, um, uh, is an average at our sites. Um, we have eight sites um, out in the field where we're doing studies. Uh, this is the study design that we use. And first I'm going to talk about the small scale study component. In this uh, component of our study, we compare um, treatments and seed mixes in small two meter by two meter plots. This was based on the USGS RestoreNet study design. Um, if you have, uh, if you're familiar with that project, and so the the treatments uh, vary site by site that we compare um, in these in these plots but some of the treatments are replicated across all sites. And that includes connectivity modifiers or con mods, uh, soil pitting, uh, those are hand dug soil pits and mulching. And we cross those treatments with uh, a variety of seed mixes 
and then set them out in a randomized layout. And I have an asterisk in there because a randomization scheme, uh, just to make things fun, uh, varies by site. Um, so two sites that I'll talk about today have a complete randomized design, another two have a randomized block design uh, with four blocks and two years of data, and then another two have a randomized block design with six blocks and a year of data. So a little bit of mix up. Uh, the monitoring that we do, um, we do a lot of different uh, data collection out in the field, but I'll be talking about plant density counts. Um, we set out quadrats and count all the species of plants and then categorize them by their functional group. So today I'll be talking about the, the response of the seeded species um, to these various treatments. And so this is just looking at the data um, from that first set of sites. So these are the sites that had a complete randomized design. Um, two years of data in the chart or in the plot there, the year one data is in blue and the year two data is in orange. And we're looking at plants per meter square. Treatments are listed at the bottom. And we did see a significant effect of year. So the plants started out strong and then uh, you know there was some dieback of seedlings, which isn't unexpected in year two. Um, and we also saw significant treatment effects. So just looking at effect size, the pits were more likely to have a greater number of plants than the mulch. Um, and both of those treatments were greater than the effect of con mods, which was essentially equivalent to no treatment at all. And then looking at another pair of sites, you know, using these are two that were using a randomized block design two years of data, um, we are not seeing any um, significant effects of treatments with these sites. And one potential reason is that after seeding these two sites, they were both seeded in 2020, uh, we had extremely low um, precipitation the following summer. And so we had very little plant establishment in the first year. Uh, this actually increased in the second year. Um, but not enough to really see any treatment level differences. And then this is looking at the last two sites, again, to ra a randomized block design, but we only had one year of data in this case. Um, we did see, again, some significant treatment effects, uh, mulching and pitting. Um, and so what, the, what this model is saying is that um, we are more likely to see plants in mulch plots and of the plots that have plants in them, um, the, you're, you're, we're more likely to see more plants in the mulch plots than we are in the pit plots, and both of them more plants than either the con mod or the control plots. So overall, from this small scale study that I've been talking about, there's been a little bit of variability. Some sites, the pits are performing, performing better, and at other sites, the mulch is performing better, but it really depends on site conditions and precipitation, we think. And so now this small scale, results of the small scale study actually inspired us to use mulch at a larger scale. So I'll be talking about using mulch at this larger scale now. Uh, these blocks are eight meters by eight meters and we're able to compare um, some treatments at the the block level. So um, there are eight blocks, uh, one through eight in this study design. The, the green blocks receive a soil roughening treatment, which we also call hummocking. Um, that's done using heavy machinery. And then the non-shaded, the white colored blocks, we flatten the soil and drill seed those plots. And then within the roughened plots and within the drill seeded plots, um, we cross two treatments, and these treatments vary by site, but I will be talking about treatments which included, or I'll be talking about sites which included mulch as a treatment. So the, when we do mulching within those blocks, we apply 28 cubic yards per acre. So it's a fairly thin layer of mulch, and we use a wood product, cedar mulch, and 
if you do the math um, using mulch that you buy at a local hardware store, um, it comes to about $2,000 an acre. So it's not a, an, a let's see, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly costly treatment. And then monitoring is pretty similar to what we do at the small scale where we count the number of plants in monitoring quadrats. There's 10 quadrats for each of these plots that we look at. And again, we, we look at the data for different plant functional groups, and I'll be talking about the response of our seeded species. Um, so in the, let's see, so this is looking at year one data for all the sites that used mulch as a treatment. And the graph here is showing, again, plants per meter square. And in this case, the shading of the bars is showing the difference between uh, the hummocked and broadcast seeded plots compared to the flat and drill seeded plots. So um, we are seeing a significant effect of this, the seed method um, where broadcast seeding is doing a little better than drill seeding, but we're also seeing a, a highly significant effect of mulching. So mulching um, increases the amount of plants per square meters. And then look, this is looking at year two data from the same set of sites. Um, so we are actually still seeing that effect of, of hummocking and broadcast seeding, so soil roughening, but the effect of mulch is, has diminished. Um, the plants in, that, in those treated areas aren't persisting um, as well as the effects of the, the hummock and mulching. Uh, although there is still a significant effect, um, regardless of whether um, these sites were broadcast or drill seeded, mulch still does increase the amount of plants per square meter a little bit. And so just to sum up kind of these three components of our, our research work, um, we found in the reclamation literature that that mulch is studied and is used as a reclamation treatment. <clears throat> Only 9% of the, the studies um, within our set of papers related to reclamation practices looked at mulch, but it is on the rise. So more studies are looking at this as a treatment um, and mulch can, can benefit plants um, through a variety of means such as water retention, um, adding soil structure or improving the soil structure or improving the soil chemistry. Um, but the effects of mulch aren't consist consistent. Um, so 40% of the papers found no effect of mulch, and there was a mix of results depending on mulch type and depth, for instance. And then from our field research um, at the small scale, we found that mulch was certainly better than no mulch and better than con mods. Um, whether mulch or pits um, is a more effective treatment was dependent on the site and the year. Um, but we don't see any response to mulch when the precipitation is extremely low. Um, and then at our large scale study, we again found that mulch is much better than no mulch, um, but the effects weren't as lasting as soil surface roughening and broadcast seeding. And also cost effective solutions are needed because at $2,000 an acre, operators aren't necessarily likely to want to use this method no matter how effective it is. Um, so that's, that's what I have for this presentation, and thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. Appreciate it. And thank you, Jeff. A virtual round of applause for both of you. Um, really, really do appreciate y'all taking the time to talk to us about your research. We have um, about 15 minutes for questions and discussion. I'd invite folks to take a moment and think about a question, put it in the, in the chat there. Um, and yeah, there's a wealth of experience in this room. So whether that question is directed at Jeff and Rebecca, or whether it's directed at the the room uh, as a as a as a larger audience to ask that question about whether you think you would use mulch or something that's uh, applicable to the grasslands that you're restoring. Um, yeah, I invite folks to to take that take that moment and write a question to the chat. And just I'll just answer one of the questions in the chat. Um, Colin asked if there was a way to get bibliography for the mulching uh, literature review that we did. And we are working on making that publicly available. There'll be an online search library 
for that bibliography soon. Amazing. It looks like Alex also has a, a question about the lit review for you there. Alex, did you want to ask your question directly or let's see. Uh, so, so the Alex asks, um, so in the literature review, did we find that mulching um, specifications were included, such as how to apply it, or was it a simply general statement of mulching versus no mulching? And it really varied by paper. Um, generally, there were details as far as what kind of mulch it was and what the application rate was. Um, I just didn't show all of the details in this presentation as far as that goes. And I didn't, um, gosh, uh, uh, Elizabeth asked if there was research on using salt cedar mulch. Um, I think there was one study which used tamarisk as a mulching material, um, but I have to go back and confirm that. <clears throat> Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I, I see also Daniel has a question in there, but I wanted to see Jeff. Did you did you all use um, salt cedar in the mulching? I, I thought that maybe I remember that, or if anybody else has used that as a as a material. Yeah, mulch. we did. Um, we did use salt cedar. We didn't have any problems with. I mean, this is these are super dry sites. Um, we didn't have any problem with sprouts. Anybody else who who's used salt cedar as a as a material for mulching? I've never used it, but um, I've heard that if you chip it finely enough, um, especially if it's near a riparian area, it won't re-sprout. That's a good call. Yeah, because I mean, in the in the dry arid sites where Jeff was using it, even as whole branch mulch, there's not much worry of it re-sprouting. Um, but yeah, chipping it near riparian areas would be a would be a good call. And uh, Rebecca, the mulch that y'all used was fairly different in structure to what Jeff was using as well, right? Like y'all were using that that sort of almost composted wood wood product as well. Um, yeah, it really was just bags of cedar mulch that you could get at the hardware store. Yeah, so it was shredded. Sometimes it it varies over the years the quality of the project. So sometimes it's more bark like, and sometimes it's more shreds. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, and folks asked for the the restore net treatments that use the similar kind of chipped wood mulch that was around. Um, we also have a case study for that on CCAS. You should check that out. Um, and it's really exciting to see those uh, those treatments from the restore net project expanding outwards. We hope to bring in more results for that um, and really focus on those questions that folks are asking about the application and how to do it and and how to implement some of those materials into the CCAS library in the future. Um, Daniel, I see your hand is raised. I'll pass it to you, and then we'll we'll get to some of those other questions that are rolling into the chat. Thanks, Ariel. <clears throat> As I sit here in Central Texas, all I hear is a is a whir and hum of chainsaws, and all this the winter storm has brought down so many trees and limbs. And I just wish that they could ship it by the ton, <laughs> like in a train over to the arid regions and use it as mulch. But my question is, like, if there's been much talk on whether to use locally sourced mulch. You know, obviously, re-sprouting is one thing. Salt cedar, you know, there used to be studies that um, about the salinization. There would be too salty for some of the arid soils, but that's kind of near waterways. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering if Rebecca kind of ran into those type of arguments and debates on, on the mulch. Um, I think it would be fabulous to use locally sourced mulch. Um, we did at one of our sites, you know, there's a lot of treatments I didn't show in this summary, but we compared different types of mulch. So we compared the store-bought mulch to mulch produced from a lumber mill in Vernal to an expensive product, a uh, commercially available product, which was created from uh, salvaged lumber, um, you know, a forest product and then even to a rock mulch. Um, and we found that the, the local um, lumber mill wood chips did just as well as the cedar mulch that we had bought from the store. The rock mulch did not perform um, 
as well, although it was still better the, than the control. And then the other um, forest-based product um, seems to be slow to respond, but I, I can't say conclusively how well it's performing um, related to the other types. Um, I think with these, I think, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with these oil and gas well pads. It's really a challenge of transporting local mulch to the Uinta Basin. Um, I was talking with one of the foresters in our local forest, the LaSalle Mountains, and they offered up wood from slash piles from their thinning efforts, but then how do you get the wood to these arid areas um, in a timely manner? I think, I think that could certainly um, uh, use a lot of attention. I, I, th I think it would be a, a great use of resources if we could figure out how to do it. Yeah, I would add to Daniel's question that, um, you know, we found we had better success growing grass under branch mulch than mulch mulch, than chipped mulch. We chipped, it was a mountain of, of mulch when I got to the park, they'd been chipping for years. Um, so a lot of it was composted um, and we put some of that out and it, it did a good job. And we had better grass growth. It, the mulch just smothers the seeds at, to some extent. So, you know, getting it the right thickness and all that is a challenge. Um, branch mulch was um, a lot less work, um, you know, and, and, and had better success growing grass. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say that I found similar things in, in my research in, in Arizona, where uh, using a, a composted or wood chipped sort of material um, in my research and the research of some of my colleagues at the University of Arizona tends to have less of a positive effect than something that really has that three dimensional structure to, yeah, as, as Jeff was finding, mimic some of those hydrological processes, shading, interception of raindrops, um, reducing that soil temperature, while also letting the, the seeds emerge. And um, we found that we had a great recruitment from the native seed bank uh, compared to no control where we were in the Altar Valley. Um, there were seeds. Of course, that's not always the case, as uh, I'm sure, Rebecca, in some of your research, where there's a giant pile of topsoil that's stockpiled and put back, the seed bank can be severely impacted. Mm -hmm. So that's not always the case. Um, it seems like there's a few other questions that have come in into, into from the chat, I noticed that uh, Katie said something about a project um, that, that they had been working on. Katie, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that project and where it was and, and the, the, the success rate that you had there? Yeah, so I work for the Park Service across the U.S. And this is just in general for projects all across the West that this is a rate that we've seen do really well. It's, you know, working with hydro mulch is readily commercially available. Um, and it's cost effective for us to do large acreages at a time. Um, so that's that goes for all across the West. It's not just one project. But yeah, we've, we've been experimenting with uh, hydro mulch rates and types of different wood mulches and uh, well, and hydro mulches in general. And we found the wood fiber really is where it's at for the West. Thanks, Katie. Jeff, I know that y'all used hydro as, uh, as well in your in your research, and I think you had to increase the amount of tackifier that you used and stuff like that. Do you have any comments about what you found successful using hydro mulching? We loved our hydro um, it, it worked, whereas seed drexine didn't. And we did. So our first year, you know, we didn't see, we didn't have a one sin season. So the seeds had to sit there for a full year without getting harvested by the ants or the birds. So we added extra tack of fire. Um, we used both a guar based and a, a polyacrylamide. If I were to go back, I'd probably stick with the guar, but it wasn't as um, um, durable as the polyacrylamide. Um, but you know the the extra, and, and you know we we weren't we're not the USGS. We didn't collect super high quality data, but just watching it, um, um, you know, I think you need the extra pack of fire and it needs to hang around for a year or two because uh, we weren't irrigating. We were waiting on the uh, productive monsoon to get everything to grow. Um, yeah, can't speak about it. And we used, a, we, we used an agitator type hydromulcher, not a jet 
stirred uh, hydromulture. That meant we could get by with less water in the field because just like hauling mulch or hauling branches is a, is a challenge, hauling water to mix your, with your hydromulture was a challenge as well. So we like the agitator variety rather than the jet variety. We used both. Um, and then we settled on, we borrowed one and then we ended up buying the agitator type. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there's another question in here from David Kitchy that, that folks might not be able to see here, but um, I think it's uh, it, it relates to this sort of seeding question that we're asking. And Rebecca, I'd love to hear what, what your thoughts are. And this, this question from David seems to be directed at you of, uh, rather than use seed drill or broadcast seeding after working the soil surface, did you find any mention in the literature of broadcast seeding uh, on the hardened ground and applying a mulch afterwards uh, and, and seeing if there are results there? Um, so, so what I'm hearing this is like, don't disturb the soil as, at all. Um, um, in our in our field research, we don't come across the situation simply because reclamation happens immediately after um, the well pads are reclaimed, which automatically involves a process of regrading and respreading topsoil. Um, so the soil is already disturbed. Um, there are a few instances where things might sit for a little while before being reseeded, but generally not. Um, so since that soil has already been worked up, it's not a lot of extra work just to, I don't know, create pockets or something in that soil. Um, in the literature, I, this, it's not, it's not, I haven't dug deep enough to really see if anyone has looked into that. Um, I'm sure there, I'm sure folks have looked into it, but in the oil and gas work that I've uh, sets of literature that I've been looking into, people usually work the soil prior to seeding and then mulch on top of it. So I guess I don't have a lot of information on how that might work compared to no. Could I add a little bit of in input? Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity of working with people who planted grass back in the 1950s during the soil bank days, the first soil bank. And they tried everything. They tried working up the soil and everything was blowing away. So they said mm. after, after failing everywhere is what they did is they tried, they sat down and kind of like figured out, well, how does the soil do it naturally? How do the plants do it naturally? You don't come through this. Uh, you don't come through there with a work it up. If you have the, if you have firm ground, if you can bounce a bowling ball off it, it's too, uh, court. this is all former cropland. Take hardened soil. Yes. They would go out there, they would use the existing stubble that they had, either mm. use a grass drill or even broadcast, and then just come over with a very light something that would just put a light coating of, um, let's say, of dust, maybe a thickness of a sheet of paper across it, and then wait for the rain. And we had some, that's what they did. We did it in the, right after the, uh, when the first CRPs back in the late 80s did this out in eastern New Mexico, West Texas, where you probably have around 10 to 14 inches of rainfall. We did it on, on areas that were, uh, wheat had been harvested, overwintered, came back the next spring and before, and in early February, we went and did a thing of kill, plant, and pray. What I mean, kill everything out there, plant the best grass that you had with a seed drill, or just go out there and then just pray for rain. And we had some, mm -hmm. I had some excellent results. I also worked with um, people from Texas who came, uh, let's see, up from, uh, who were planted grass down in the, um, let's see, in the uh, Rio Grande River Valley. And they said that, well, yeah, this is the way we're doing it down there. Take uh, the hardened ground that had, you know, just use the existing soil because you don't, if it doesn't rain, you have to have something to hold the ground. Plant into that and then just wait for the, and just pray for rain. And we actually yeah. did. And, and um, let's see, as somebody was saying that if it doesn't rain, that grass plant has got to sit out there and wait. I would say if you do use a grass drill, use surveying stake flags, put them in the grass rows, because when it does rain, then you can go back and you, there may be a lot of other stuff growing, but you can look through that and at least find out. And if you see a little grass plant row, find one, start looking, just get on your hands and knees and start moving that stuff back and you'll, You'd be surprised how much grass you can get. 
that's that's what I did and had had luck there. But out here in Arizona, where you got a very high evapotranspiration rate, it may rain, it may not mon mm -hmm. may not monsoon. Things can be different. That's just yeah. And I, I think one lesson from that is that having some kind of vertical structure can be pretty helpful. Like you know, just in microsite creation, shade and and blocking the wind and 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 functions like that, but it also traps blowing sediment. You know, we found that in other experiments where it can help to build up soil if you just have something to capture it. And I'm sure that could come in helpful in that situation. And I think that's, I think mulch has a, re, has a very good advantage, but it's getting it out there and at the rate of what, $2,000 an acre, that, that is uh, prohibitive for most, for most um, people. Have you ever just tried, have you been able to establish it in strips and then have it seed downwind at all? Has that been tried at all? Um, uh, we, have, we haven't measured it. We haven't measured spread outside of mulched zones. Um, but I certainly, you know, there's a lot of work looking at, at island restoration. I think there's a lot of potential there too. Okay. Thank you very much for this. I, I'm enjoying your, your work and, and, and this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, David. We appreciate it. Jeff, that had, did you see any establishment downwind or downslope of the, the strips that you established at, at Big Bend? Um, banded vegetation moves uphill. So we found um, establishment or growth uphill. Uh, basically, ponded water, dead material gets washed into our debris dams or our filter strips um, on the upstream side. So that's where we found um, plants expanding. That's interesting, and and um, David, just the just as a an a, another piece to add to that puzzle of not um, of minimizing soil disturbance. Uh, that's kind of what we did in the Altar Valley for my research is just sort of scatter some seeds down and throw branches on top of it, um, and we saw good establishment there. But the soil texture was really different. Um, our soil texture there was really coarse and gravel rich, uh, so would allow that moisture to, to infiltrate, whereas in, in Big Bend, they have a very fine soil texture. So I think that paying attention to soil is, is definitely important when you're thinking about how you're applying those seeds and, and the mulch. Um, and that also brings us to Rosie's question. I want to, I know that we're a little bit over time here, but I want to get to Rosie Gonzalez's question here about um, mixing in compost with fungi or, or thinking, I'm, I'm interpreting that as well as just a larger um, using fungi or, or, or soil microbes or soil organisms to aid in restoration or establishment. Um, and yeah, I don't know if Rebecca or, or Jeff, y'all have used that or anybody else on this call has, but would love to hear about it. Never worked with it. Um, we, we do have both of those in our treatment design, uh, in, our, in our set of treatments that we're testing, um, but we're just starting to do analysis. So I, I can't answer conclusively yet um, you know, how those are, 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 are vying as far as plant establishment. I mean, one interesting uh, site, we are crossing mulching with integrated compost. So I'm interested to see how that affects the outcome. Composting is actually a fairly common practice among some operators in the Uinta Basin um, to help improve soil organic matter. So it will be interesting to see how, that, how effective that is. I just wanted to share one last slide here. And this is the slide I realized I'd forgotten to put in my presentation, but the, this is a strip back here. And this is expansion. All this on the left side is where the water ponds as it runs into this strip. Um, so we are seeing, um, seeing the, you know, the, the plant community expand beyond our treatment. This was taken two weeks ago. That's amazing. I, I, I love put out in 2004. Thanks so much for going back out there, Jeff, and taking those pictures recently. This is really, really valuable to have these sort of long-term results and monitoring results. Um, yeah. Thank you yeah, again. You and um, yeah, I think that's it. I think that brings us to the end of our questions and we're about five minutes over time. So uh, we'll let everyone go. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the great discussion, for the great questions. Um, I will be making a little webinar summary for this and I'll send it out probably as well uh, alongside the land treatment exploration tool uh, webinar that we had last week. I'll send those out together to everyone.
Um, a reminder that you can find the recordings of these webinars on the CCAST YouTube page. Um, if you signed up for this webinar, you will start receiving emails from me. Uh, sorry, not sorry. If you uh, if you don't want to receive them, let me know. I'll take you off the list. Um, yeah, please do join us again uh, just in our future webinars and would love to hear some feedback on hydrology and erosion, the toolkit that we put together uh, next week. We're really hoping that that'll be a, a helpful tool for restoration managers and uh, grassland managers who are looking to improve conditions in grasslands where there is excessive erosion or disturbed hydrology like we were talking about today. Um, thank you so much. Let me see if I'm missing anything here in my parting words. Um, yeah, if, if y'all uh, have some specific speakers or subjects that you would like to hear about more, please do let me know. My email uh, should be in your inbox at this point. Just let me know. Always, always willing to talk about grassland restoration, grassland stuff. So thank you again to Rebecca and to Jeff. Um, that'll be all. Thanks for hosting, Ariel. Most welcome.